Namaste and a very warm welcome for yet another show with social impact leader simply with Suparna. And by now you'd know as is cursory, I like to start with paying my obeisance to the higher power. Whatever the higher power that you believe in, for me, Shakti has held me in good stead. And I'd like to pay my respects to her with this very old Sanskrit verse, the Saraswati Vandana. Essentially, She's the goddess of wisdom. She's the goddess of knowledge, of creativity, of art and culture. But most importantly, she's somebody who helps us dispel the darknesses that are residing in our hearts with the wisdom of knowledge. Ya kundendu tusharahar dhavala, ya shubra vastravrita, ya veena varadanda manditakara, ya shweta padamasana, ya brahmachutta shankar prabhuti bhi, devai sada vandita, Samam Patu Saraswati Bhagavati Nishesh Jadyapaha. So uh, we have been fe featuring, you know, individuals uh, who are leading organizations or even as individuals themselves doing um, work which is putting India on the road to development, who have been uh, overcoming the challenges either from a personal level or from a community level and creating solutions not only for themselves, but for their entire society around. And Sabera essentially highlights these individuals, entities, uh, and projects such that it can catalyze development for, for the country. If there is some good work which is happening on one part of the country, um, you know, there can be lessons and knowledge shared for the other part of the country, uh, you know, having the same geographical or climatic condition, etc. Today, I have a very special guest here with me who likes to be called a gardener because when I asked him, how do you like to be referred to? He says, I'd like to be referred to as a gardener. Now, he is very special in the sense that uh, there is a grassroots level organization that he has founded. And that grassroots level organization, Severa recognized a couple of years back. And today, there is the world is recognizing them. They have uh, companies that are supporting them, but there's a long, long way to go. And as part of our um, mission to popularize the work, to catalyze development, to help Severa awardees reach a larger audience, we have none other than Utsav Pradhan here with us. He is a local environmental champion and the founder of Tiri. Now, there's an interesting um, concept of uh, Tiri as well. And I'll let you know, I'll let Utsav basically uh, tell us about why the name Tiri. It's a very interesting name. Uh, like I said, Tiri has been a Sabera awardee. Uh, they have been working in the eastern belt of the Himalayas and Tiri today is at the forefront of climate action in the hills of Darjeeling through its projects like uh, zero waste, responsible tourism, and experiential environment education. Utsav, thank you so much for taking the time for being here with us and talking about your journey. And most importantly, thank you for TV. Thank you, Suparna. And uh, it's an honor to be on this platform. And uh, thank you once again for your support to uh, our project so far. Well, you know what? Before we get into anything else, I love where you're sitting. Can you, okay. can you please tell us where exactly are you sitting? What is this? So uh, these were, uh, we build this natural cottages. Uh, we call this uh, the TD dwellings. So I'm sitting in one of them. So this is called uh, uh, the TD air dwelling. And uh, this is a mud cottage, and uh, we have uh, travelers coming in and staying here. And uh, so it's, it's a beautiful uh, little nook in the forest. You can see it's uh, something wow. like this. And this is all natural material, huh? mud yeah. and bamboo, which is local bamboo. source. Yeah, and working with the local craftsmen as well as with uh, architects who are interested to explore the world of uh, natural dwellings. So uh, we build a couple of these. Uh, dwellings and uh, where people come and experience living in the forest where they're just like you know a walkable distance from the main road wow this is super and this is just one of the projects that td is doing which is responsible as part of the responsible tourism and we'll talk in detail about that but i want to get to know you first in terms of who you are as a person because 
often in my interactions i have figured that you know there is a challenge that an individual faces especially the ones who are extremely passionate about what they're doing and those are the ones that sabera actually recognizes uh when you're so passionate about something there is there is something which is personal involved in it you know that's how passion comes across it can be a challenge from an individual level it can be a challenge uh you know within a family member or a child that somebody has faced and and that's what actually leads them to creating a full organization that helps not only themselves but is actually helping and trying to create a social impact in the community and the larger society that they inhabit so so i would want to understand you and let's start with with your childhood what what have been your influences because you look like when i speak to you you look like a man of the world who's been around who knows his stuff it's not somebody who has been confined to a place and you know is is not really worldly wise so how was it growing up for you and and how did you actually come up with tv sure so uh, i grew up in the small town in darjeeling called uh, kushion we call it kharsang here and um, i grew up playing you know with my friends um, in the rivers that we used to play and you know drink water straight from that particular river that is there we used to walk into the forest and go forage for wild chestnuts or wild berries and uh, there was a lot of time that was spent outdoors you know learning from uh, each other as well as learning from nature um and uh, after uh, finishing my school here i uh, went to delhi and uh, i uh, uh, studied there worked there for some time and then my last uh, stint in the corporate world was in hyderabad where i worked with a startup uh, called next education and we were into education technology so i've been uh, like working outside for almost two decades before i decided to kind of move back now the question as to why i moved back and started this project is because um, you know uh, when i came back the first thing that i noticed was uh, none of the children were outdoors anymore you know and everyone was hooked to their devices and uh, the sad thing was even if there was someone who is looking to go play in a river there were no rivers that were alive anymore so wow. almost all the rivers were dead Wow. and if someone is looking to go into a forest uh, the challenge was the forest was not as biodiverse as it was earlier wow. and uh, yeah. there were uh, deeper challenges of the soil also being degraded where certain things that used to grow very well here like cardamom and oranges uh, those cash crops have also started dying out so that means there is a lot of uh, disenchantment amongst the people here of growing their food you know so a lot of Uh, youth were migrating away from uh, this place and moving outside because working uh, with the land seemed like the most difficult thing to do which is sad you know? so I, i think you've really hit the nail on the head because i've noticed this not just in uh, you know as you're mentioning here in your part of the world in india but also in other hilly terrains mm-hmm. i uh, imagine that there are a lot of youngsters who don't want to stay there anymore you know right. they're looking at uh, maybe also just joining the army or right. coming to the city and looking for a vacation for themselves and really these villages are inhabited by old people and women that's about right. all that is left you know and this is across india this is not just where you're talking about so i think it's a very important aspect that you've touched upon here as well and in right. hindi mein isko स्पेसिफिकली पलायन बोलते हैं कि यू नो छोड़ के चले गए वहां पर एंड देन देर ऑब्वियसली सेंडिंग सम अमाउंट ऑफ मनी बैक और वट एवर इट इज बट इन अ वे दैट दीज आर गोस्ट टाउन्स राइट राइट सो दीज गोस्ट विलेजेस एग्जिस्ट इन दार्जिलिंग टू एंड इट इज सैड दैट यू नो व्हेन द इकोलॉजिकल बैलेंस गेट्स ऑल्टर्ड इन अ प्लेस दैट्स वेल दैट्स व्हेन द सोशल फैब्रिक आल्सो स्टार्ट्स कमिंग अपार्ट इज व्हाट वी हैव नोटिस्ड हियर and uh, so that was basically the um, inspiration for uh, setting up tiri and also having discovered uh, permaculture in my life journey which became like a guiding light to solve some of these uh, existing problems which are seemingly complex but some of the solutions are embarrassingly simple wow okay hold on what is permaculture 
So uh, permaculture basically is a, a design-based approach uh, to, uh, you know, have a whole systems-based solution for any problem that you have, right? So it was coined by um, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, so two Australians who kind of put together all the knowledge from their past, uh, you can say, teachers who have spearheaded the natural farming movement. So it started off by a movement to define how do you keep agriculture permanent, you know, and make it more sustainable. So that's where when you conjoin two, permanent agriculture becomes permaculture. Right. But over the years, when its solution got applied into other spheres of um, life, like a building, like we build naturally because that's more, you know, uh, regenerative, you know, because uh, you're working with bamboos and you're working with mud. So that's how you apply permaculture to buildings. Now, when you're looking at waste management, how do you create circular systems and instead of linear systems? That's again a permaculture-based approach. So, you know, so a lot of these ideas I had probably subscribed already in my head, but it was permaculture that kind of uh, took each one and joined it together and said, "Hey, it's all uh, kind of uh, knit together with a common, uh, let's say, shell uh, that is permaculture." So, uh, something I discovered... you learn every day: permanent agriculture is permaculture but what does permaculture do so basically it gives you uh, again very simple it gives you a set of ethics okay three ethics which is uh, earth care people care and fair share so anything that you do right uh, earth care, do you do... people share and uh, uh, sorry earth care people care and fair share yeah. earth care people care and fair share so if you do this like a checklist, which is your set of ethics now, mm. on every aspect of your life, you will live in harmony, right? So uh, till now, unfortunately, what we've done is we've just probably done a check on either one or max of two of these uh, checklists. So these set of ethics are the guiding uh, ethics of permaculture. And then you have the set of principles that talk about uh, like, you know, how do you start uh, solving a problem. So the first step is to observe. So there is something called uh, a protracted observation. You know, So if you're working with the land and you want to, let's say, grow something in the land, first thing that you do is come and spend a few seasons in the land, You know, see how the rainfall is, see what the water flow is. So, so those are like different principles that uh, is shared by permaculture. So one of those principles being create no waste. You know, So you may have like a great idea you know, to solve some of the world's problem, like the energy problem, right? You may have a great idea of solar panels, but what do you do with the solar panels once it's, how do you retire them? Is there a way exactly. that you, yeah. are you trying to create yeah. a problem for the future? Yeah. You know, so if you look Same at it from a permaculture way, Same you don't. thing with electric cars. What do you do with the batteries when the, once exactly. they're done? Right. Yeah. Right. So the permaculture approach would be uh, applying uh, nature mimicry to, you know, a lot of these solutions are already there in nature, like the way it manages its own waste, you know, the composting process and the way it grows its own food. You know, what interesting thing about permaculture that uh, hit me hard was, you know, uh, we talk about this problem of soil, right? And, uh, or, and the whole process of trying to regenerate soil or different ways of growing food. Then someone uh, mentioned that in the forest, do you ever see soil? I said, no, I don't see soil in the forest. It's always covered. Then uh, the person asked me, and do you think the forest soil is rich? I said, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there's so much of life that's thriving there. Then uh, the question, then the point was, then the soil is shy. You know, the soil should never be exposed to sun or rain. So that's how you need to grow your food. So that's how the natural farming practices are. You never expose the soil to either the sun or uh, the rain you know so you do uh, like a ground up gardening you know and uh, you do ins you ensure that it's mulched forever like it's in the forest so that way you don't have to like you know go after this quick fix methods of uh, either organic or inorganic fertilizers and then in the forest there is like different biodiverse uh, uh, plants that you're growing so that's what you do in a natural farming um, like terrace of uh, a permaculture bed. 
So just one of those examples of how permaculture can be applied. So interestingly, what you're trying to say or what I'm hearing is that anything which is in sync with nature, right. that's what permaculture is all about. All kind of uh, naturally addressed problems or naturally right. addressed solutions rather to the problems. Um, right. Like composting, for example, or um, you know, sustainable agriculture, and this is something uh, you know interesting that you shared that in a rainforest, none of the soil is actually exposed. It's not exposed to direct sunlight or direct rain, and that's how maybe you know agriculture in your part of the world, in your part of where uh, you know the forest dwellings are, that's how food is created. So, so it's interesting to note that. And um, um, so what is the temperature like there right now when you're in the middle of the forest? <laughs> so right now, the temperature is close to about uh, 15, yeah, 16 degrees Celsius. Wow. Amazing. And, and the house that you're sitting in, the mud house, this is also a, an example of permaculture, right? Right. Right. And also very simple design. Like you see, um, we are allowing... Uh, whatever sunlight that comes in gets captured in uh, through the uh, windows that's there on, let me show it to you. That's there here. So these are the windows on the south side. Okay. And once this window gets in a little bit of sunlight. Oh, so I think your, your video is a little scratchy. Uh, your audio, of course, is there. Yeah. Now we can see the windows. Yes. Okay. So these windows let in the sunlight and then the mud walls capture the sunlight. So this is called passive solar design. You know, so you are not using energy much except for what the sun is giving you. So right. these homes are cool in summers, are warm in winters, naturally. Right. right. Okay. And, and, and this kind of a house, if I want to come and experience this kind of a house, is it possible for me to do that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We've been hosting uh, uh, travelers for over uh, six years now. And okay. uh, in fact... Uh, we are uh, the number one rated uh, specialty lodging in all of Darjeeling. Uh, according oh, wow. To and, how uh, nice, outlook, how nice uh, is that? So, so basically, this is what responsible tourism is. And in case whoever is watching, you would like to visit uh, this mud house, uh, which is designed keeping the principles of permaculture in mind and experience Darjeeling the way Utsav has you know, maintained in, in the TD, you know, so that's, that's what it is, right? Your TD compound, what can we say? It's like, uh, it's like a little, little city that you've created there, a little village that you've created there. We like to call it a forest garden. Okay, a forest where... garden. <laughs> yes. And how does one go about coming here? So uh, we are located a little before Darjeeling. So it's about uh, 18 kilometers before Darjeeling. The nearest uh, airport is Bagdogra Airport. The nearest train station is New Jalpaiguri. And from either the airport or the train station, it's a two-hour drive up. And um, the bookings can be done on your website or through yes. your Instagram or any right. of the social media accounts, which is right. T-I-E-E-D-I. -E -E Yes, we invented the word, so it will it wouldn't be difficult for anyone to find us online. What does the word mean? I know uh, it, but I want you to share it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's actually um, uh, inspired by uh, a documentary. It's called Ancient Futures, Learning from Ladakh, where uh, there is a Ladakhi folk song that people sing when they are like harvesting the uh, paddy, I think. And um, so... Uh, when uh, it goes like da 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 da, so when translated in English, it comes across as "take it easy, easy does it." Okay, so it's actually uh, TD is an acronym for "take it easy, easy does it." Take it easy, easy does it. And there is also another. Uh, I remember initially when you had submitted to, uh, through uh, Sabera a couple of years back. And um, um, I was doing a voiceover for the film that we were creating because for all Sabera Awardees, we create this small film that gets showed through the awards night and, and the organizations are free to use it for their promotion as well. And I didn't know how to pronounce this. And I think Rucha from our team reached out to you and you said that essentially this is how the cicada makes a noise. It's TD. 
That's what yeah. you keep hearing all the time. T D T. Yeah, yeah. So the coincidences were uh, very uh, interesting. So the cicadas that uh, will, uh, like you know, completely populate our forest now in the month of uh, July and August. Uh, that's how they go. Like throughout the day, T D T D. It's like goes on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy. Easy does it. Right. Okay. Super. Okay, now let's come to the other aspects that you are um, covering through TD. One is, of course, uh, you know, designs in sync with nature, as we can see in the mud house that you are sitting in, which is promoting responsible tourism. But um, you are also very actively involved in creating zero waste villages. And I think you also organized a run, uh, I think the Green Mile, if I'm not mistaken. Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, in fact, um, where we are located, uh, which is like uh, a forest garden that uh, gives a lot of joy to people when they come, uh, was actually a dump yard. And uh, we set about uh, recovering this uh, molested acre of land back into a rainforest, like I said, by applying the principles of permaculture. And while doing that, uh, invariably, we got drawn towards uh, finding more holistic solutions to the waste management problem, where it was not just about like, you know, uh, cleaning up the place, but ensuring that there is nothing that goes ahead and, um, you know, uh, dirties the place again. So then uh, we realized that, you know, people did not have solutions. So then we started innovating. So we have... Uh, the home composting units that uh, we have, then we have the community composting units that we've designed. Then we have uh, now uh, a facility for people in and around where we live, where we uh, take complete charge of their waste, where we even take the dry waste. So we have a, a very strong team. Uh, we call them the green milers. They are our real heroes okay? who um, work on ensuring that waste is segregated further into 39 different categories. So even a cigarette butt is set aside and whatever can be uh, recycled is uh, recycled and whatever cannot be recycled, we are seeking ways, innovative solutions to find uh, ways to uh, upcycle that kind of a waste. But then having said that, we've also tried to nip it at the bud or close off the tap by introducing um, zero waste products. You know, so we've got an eco store now. Uh, mm -hmm. where uh, people come and uh, let's say shop for uh, things like a toothbrush, which we've got as a bamboo toothbrush. Or mm -hmm. let's say uh, if they want a, a shampoo, you know, we've got a shampoo bar where we have worked with the local artisans who can make those shampoo bars, which is uh, equally good, if not better than your shampoo bar that comes in a bottle. So mm -hmm. we've got over 150 products now in the eco store that becomes an alternative for people to uh step into the world of natural living so now rucha is asking you would love to hear about mato and ban bath <laughs> right so uh mato uh is a flagship uh a permaculture design certification course uh so after we set up the classroom in the forest we started hosting uh workshops and courses for people to come and learn more about uh you know permaculture natural living uh, waste management. So Mato is our flagship uh, permaculture design certification course, which we host uh, once in a year. And uh, then uh, Ban Bhat. Now Ban Bhat is interesting because uh, it was like uh, colloquially it translates into a forest picnic and something that I grew up uh, with my uh, folks uh, taking us out into the forest along with like their set of friends. And you just go and, you know, uh, cook in the forest and it's a beautiful time but again like I said when I came back no one used to do it anymore so we decided to kind of create an event in TD called the Ban Bhat where we not just serve like you know mouth watering gastronomical delights but by calling the chefs over and like you know doing a lot of research on the indigenous uh, cuisine that is there and adding a twist to it but we also call in artists and we call in musicians and we call in painters. So it becomes like a, a three days extravagant fest in the forest. Wow. Wow. I am so coming over to live in this 
mud house and enjoy <laughs> enjoy the delicious cuisines i'm already watering in my mouth saliva is there <laughs> very interesting i would love it and uh, for those of you who do not know how to go about booking for td all you need to do is log into their website or their instagram uh, handle and they'll be happy to host you but they do have an advisory and that advisory strongly recommends only people who can you know um uh, probably align to their philosophy of responsible tourism which includes a few things just the what are those things yeah so uh, we have this uh, what td is and what td is not document okay so that's something that we've started sending out to people inquiring for booking immediately so this is a place uh, where you'd like to uh, come and connect to mother nature and which invariably leads you to connect to your deeper self um this is not a place where you're looking to forget your life for that momentary pleasure okay and treat it and thrash it and you know go back um it's not really a party place okay and uh, it's not really a place where uh, you come just to kind of uh, take you know? so we kind of do uh, it's like an exchange of energy so we uh, ensure that you know people who come in here also adds uh value to the place uh, just by the sheer presence of uh, what they are seeking and uh right. the energy that they are bringing into the forest so utsa there is an interesting question that has been asked right now by uh, monu kumari she says what are the solutions for the non recycled products that you use can you brief us about that that's a tough one like what we discussed that while you can use solar panels but how do you kind of dispose of once they've lived their life and um, um in my two bits it's it's really at the source itself i mean we one has to adapt to uh, products which uh, you know which can be composted but but i'll let you answer this now right so um you know i'll give you a couple of examples so this is a great question i'm glad that this was asked because when we collect waste so uh, you know so there is like about 50% that's recyclable and there is this whole pile of non recyclable products like for example you have the mlps that is like a, a major packaging uh waste that comes across right from the chips packet to biscuit packets to your masala packets everything is packaged in something called a multi layer plastic so that cannot be recycled in terms of the current recycling market that we have but there are ways where there are uh, companies and uh, there are uh, innovators who have come up with uh, interesting uh, machinery uh, which can work on you know shredding it and uh, uh, you know creating molds and heat pressing it so that it can be made into blocks that can be used for let's say a partition board you know, or um that can be used to create a ceiling partition so things like that so that's one example tetra pack again how, how expensive is this how expensive is this um so each machine would be costing let's say the smallest one upwards of like let's say 8 to about 12 lakh rupees and then uh, the operational cost that is attached to it and uh, Uh, the expense is not so much in terms of the operational cost because raw materials is relative rel you can say just free right you're just working with waste but it's just the capital intensive cost that is there so that is the right. reason why we are also doing a fundraising to uh, build a waste innovation center to ensure that we uh, create this place where all waste is either recycled or upcycled within that waste innovation center which also doubles up as a experiential uh, learning institute you know so it's a very very ambitious plan that we have and uh, that's the reason why uh, we have like you know reached out to people to seek help saying that hey this is something that we feel can redefine the way that people perceive waste so it's called the waste innovation center that is coming up in td now so so you are being requested to also talk about the khamba now considering that you've spoken about the waste based innovation center venuka rai wants you to say something about khamba i'm sure she's involved with your projects as well 
<laughs> right, right. She's been an ardent uh, supporter for TD and its products. So, so Kamba is a very interesting uh, product. It was uh, initially designed by uh, Daily Dump. You know, they got featured in Shark Tank too. So uh, I reached out to them when I realized that the Hills did not have a, a composting solution, uh, a home composting solution. So we did a design partnership and I came back and I started uh, working with the local uh, potters and the artisans here. And we designed Kamba here in uh, Siliguri itself. And now these home composting units are spread across, you know, uh, along with the other ones that we've decide, uh, designed from upcycled uh, plastic buckets. So those are known as malbattas, and then there is Kamba. So we've got two home composting uh, units and uh, they, you can say, gobble up all your biodegradable waste in every household. And it's now spread in over 300 households across uh, Darjeeling and Sikkim Himalayas. And uh, uh, we combine that with uh, something called a catalyst, which is um, a forest indigenous microorganism that goes along with the kamba. It's like a medium that people just spread on their uh, biodegradable waste. And that slowly converts that into soil. That's like, you know, once it's decomposed, it smells exactly like how a forest soil smells like. Sure. Sure. So there is composting activator is what I use on my rooftop, considering that I am not there in the forest there with you, which I hopefully will be um, in the near future. But tell us a little more about, um, uh, I, I know there was this gentleman who'd come with you through the Sabera Awards and you did not come up on stage to receive the trophy and instead you encouraged him to come across. Um, tell us that, that, that story about him. Yeah, so uh, Saroj um, is from uh, this village called Rajhatta, which also is one of the first zero waste village, I think, in West Bengal, and uh, definitely in Darjeeling. So uh, he uh, used to align with you know any of the projects that we used to do. He used to come and volunteer, you know, and he used to take the guests out. The guests used to enjoy spending time with him when he used to take them on a hike and to his home to have a meal. And then when we started uh, this Green Mile project, uh, uh, he was one of the first ones that we got on board. So he's this bundle of energy, and so he's a uh, he's been a. RJ is a poet and uh, he's someone who is uh, like, you know, a man who wears many hats. So he can repair anything that is like, you know, uh, that needs repairing. So when he started working on the Green Mile project, uh, he showed a lot of promise to, uh, you know, take this project further. And uh, he was this bright spark that was required to do the dreary job of like, you know, working with waste. So um, when you invited us to uh, receive uh, the award uh, last year, um, we uh, I, I spoke to him. Then I was like, Delhi uh, jaoge. So he was like, I've never been out from here, you know. Then I said, and he's originally taken... from Nepal, right? No, no, he's from Darjeeling only, not from Nepal. Oh, he's from Darjeeling because he was yeah. wearing a Nepalese uh, hat and and he also sung in Nepalese. So I assume that he's from Nepal. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Nepali is uh, the lingua franca of Tajling also. We speak in Nepali. The dialect is a little different, but uh, Nepali is our mother tongue too, right? So, and there is like a lot of similarity in uh, the dress that is there because it's a shared culture that is there across Correct. both sides of the Himalayas. Correct. So, yeah, and he's a singer too. He writes poems and he's a singer too. So uh, it was his first train ride and it was his first visit to the capital of India. Wow. And then, yeah gave me a lot of joy to kind of nudge him to go and take that uh, and receive that award and to see him standing there amidst all the CEOs and MDs of the company very proud saying that hey I deserve this he had just and one grouse oh yeah he had just one grouse which I shared with you that time saying why didn't they let me speak on the stage <laughs> <laughs> but I think I more than made up because we created yes. a special little capsule with him right. singing and him receiving the trophy and we popularized that. I hope he right. doesn't we love that. that. Yeah, we love that. I showed that to him. <laughs> yeah. And no less, he's straight away from uh, never traveling in a train 
uh, reached the UNESCO building, no less, in New right. Delhi. So that was quite interesting. And, and also what heartens me is that while large organizations may be focusing on one or two projects, here is a grassroots level organization uh, you know, you have actually um, innovated with local material, with wisdom of the land that prevails there, and also maintain the social cultural fabric in whatever that is that you are doing. And naturally and organically, there are multiple things that have, uh, you know, innovated and generated there. So that is a really, really commendable thing. And it seems that a lot more uh, <laughs> comments are coming in. There is Karma Lama who's asking how much would a khamba cost, which is locally available and locally made by you guys? Yeah, the khamba, we are retailing it in uh, Darjeeling and Sikkim Himalayas for 2,700 rupees. Uh, the Malbatta, we are retailing it for uh, fifteen hundred rupees. But that is coming. Uh, this price in includes the catalyst, which is like the whole pack that lasts you about two months or so. It's a starter pack of catalyst. Right. Um, and also, Manu Kumari is talking about. Uh, okay, let me show her comment one more time, and that's probably the last one that we'll take. It's commendable that you have converted the dump yard into such a beautiful place. Plus your green uh, Miller work and many more. Such initiative needs to be taken up for climate action. Your organization is doing great work. Would love to know more about it. So, yes, the fact is that you started literally with a dump yard. Is that correct? Right, right. So, I mean, till date, so in the seven years, we've taken out 10,000 sacks of plastic from this one acre of land that we have. And these are plastic that has been lying there since the last 20 to 30 years. Because when you take out the plastic and when you rub it, and so plastic does not biodegrade, right? When you take out the plastic, rub it, you see the manufacturing date, it's 1993, somewhere 20, 20, 2001. So we've got toothpaste, we've got like a Garnier shampoo, you know, and uh, we've got a, a Pepsi bottle or a Kaini packet, so it's all lying there underground and, uh, uh, you know, and it's troubling the land because uh, it's leaching out chemicals. Plus, it is uh, distur disturbing the ecological balance of the soil there. And no wonder that we are struggling in the hills to uh, continue with the rich legacy of growing such like, you know, uh, crops that used to grow only here, like the uh, black cardamom, the large cardamoms used, Sikkim and Darjeeling Himalayas used to be the largest producer across the world for black cardamom, but they are we are struggling now to grow that. The Darjeeling oranges, like once you've tasted Darjeeling oranges, you feel like, okay, what have I been tasting so far? It's it's like got this very sweet, distinct taste, and that's dying out too. Similarly, from the wild, we have chestnuts that's dying out. We have uh, our own version of avocados that we used to call lapche kaulo. That's dying out. We don't see that in the market anymore. We have uh, we used to have wild olives. That's dying out. We used to have this magenta cherry called uh, kamuna. That's dying. You don't see that anymore at all. So uh, it's sometimes scary to know that you know so much is getting extinct from the wild that we still don't know yet. But uh, biodiversity that we keep talking about is you know, targeted with these uh, plastic bottles and packets, which are actually imposing, you know, their chemical constitution onto the natural land because they will not decompose. They're not going on the contrary. You know, when you say leaching chemicals over a period of time, over 800, 900 years, they're continuously poisoning the land, literally. Right, right. And uh, so uh, for us, uh, the project, like I said, it's not a farm. A TD is not a farm. We don't intend to be a farm. We don't intend to be a resort or a retreat. It is a forest garden where uh, the whole concept is to nurture this biodiversity. You know, So it gives us a lot of joy to see the amount of bees, butterflies, birds that's like, you know, started um, repopulating themselves within TD. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, so that gives us a lot of joy because... When we plant something for us, it is about like 
is it having multiple functions? That's how we look at it as Pamba Bacha. Like a lot of people like Bogan Villa, right? So it kind of goes over your gate, looks when it flowers, it looks so great. But unfortunately, it is not native and it does not support the local bees. So we went searching for something that would go over a gate arch. And we found a wild rose that the bees literally uh, can't get over once it starts flowering. So we've got the wild rose that's now slowly climbing over our main arch. So it takes time. So it's not a 100 meter race uh, we are into right now. It's a marathon. It's a slow paced a lonely ultra marathon, I would say, that we are on right now. Not many people would understand what we are doing, but we're happy doing what we're doing. There are not many people who would last long in our journey too. They come, okay, they experience it, and sometimes it kind of overwhelms them. It's the whole sheer uh, slow pace, but a dedicated pace towards uh, living in harmony with Mother Nature. So because, you know, in this uh, world where we are constantly... Um, you know, trying to live with something that is Insta, something that's in your face, like Facebook, Instagram, and all of that. When you talk about slowing down, when you talk about, uh, you know, having to walk instead of like, let's say a car dropping you right in front of uh, your resort, it kind of uh, takes people aback a little. But then the ones who stay, like uh, the people who are with us right now, folks who have spent like over six years working very closely with us. They are the ones who understand. And uh, I think uh, it's about uh, what matters to us is, you know, how many of those uh, rebels that we can attract to be part of this cause. And there are not many, but just a few who do the work that probably hundreds could not be able to do. I think, you know what, Utsa, what you have managed to achieve single-handedly, uh, if I were to sum it up, it's only in sync with Mother Nature. That's what it is. Uh, utilizing the wisdom of the land, maintaining the cultural, social, uh, you know, inclinations of the fabric of, of the place. Um, utilizing the material which is locally available. Utilizing the manpower or the woman power which is locally available and you know, putting that whole thing together. Um, I think a lot of us and Rucha has also mentioned in one of the comments that a lot of the people, while they may have migrated in different parts of the world, always keep dreaming of coming back to the native land and trying to do, or, you know, the reason why they left, they want to come back and make that change. And and yours is an example that can be emulated, you know, in any any part of the world, especially in in the country now that India is on the road to development, it's it's racing ahead. And I think examples like yours would be, um, you know, would be ideal to emulate. We'll wrap up this conversation, but not without um, any particular anecdote on the journey that you may want to share with us. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. So uh, just before we move to the anecdote, I'd like to correct that, you know, it hasn't been a, a single handed effort. There have been numerous people like volunteers who've come and contributed. And of course, uh, my local team is definitely there. But uh, I think the forest is going to bring the people over to contribute in whatever way. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. There have been volunteers who stayed with us for a couple of months, but a couple of weeks, but then there are others who spent more than two years. So each one of them have added value to the place. So, wow. so volunteers have come from across the country, is it? Across the world, actually. We've had volunteers wow. from over uh, 45 different countries as per the last count. And we've had over uh, 300 volunteers who've come and uh, like given a hand. And uh, some of them have been crazy. Like one of the anecdotes I'll uh, tell you was, uh, so there was this guy um, who just arrived one day. Okay. And anyone come on top of a dump yard right? and top of that Kanchenjunga, the majestic mountain that is visible from Darjeeling is not even visible from our place. So we were listed in couch surfing because we wanted to meet some people from outside. You know? So um, he came over and he was staying and uh, we, he said, okay, I'll stay over for a few days and let me give you a hand with whatever that you're doing. And uh, we went and we, we were taking a walk in the forest. And uh, so Jimmy, uh, he's from Australia. So the background was uh, he works six months of the year, the other six months he travels. Right. So uh, 
we found a tree that was it was not dead yet right so we went and started digging on the roots of this tree as to why is this tree fallen down you know it's very hard because we went 3 feet under when we started digging into the root the roots were completely gagged you know with plastic it was like from all corners it's like plastic come and it was like very very like a tree been taken down by plastic that's something that's very hard to imagine as to what we felt so when you see something like that it hits you very hard we took out the plastic that is there you know removed it as much as possible and uh, we kind of uh, call it the uh, the giving tree of uh, td right now you kind of, it's a small a spiritual place for us because that's where our journey of zero waste started so uh, jimmy and me we were like silent for a little while and then we walked in we neared that pathway from which we could look up to the tree and he looked up and he says uh, so so this like it was hardly about like a 7 meter to about 10 meter patch He's like, I'm going to, and it's on a steep slope. I'm talking about close to about 70 degree slope of land. He's like, I'm going to clear every bit of plastic before I'm going to move from here, please. Okay. And I was like, I was just nodding my head. And we thought it's going to take him like uh, a day or two. And he started. And so imagine a man on his haunches, like, you know, on a steep slope. And he's just taking out plastic. He just got a small rake in hand and he's taking out plastic. So... And he's going deeper and deeper and whatever he felt was hard ground. And then he kind of took out the plastic and he kept moving up. It took him 14 days working almost like five to six hours every day. And he took out 35 sacks of plastic from that in terms of square feet. Is so, um, so that. And when I asked Jimmy, saying that, uh, dude, why are you doing it? You know, I can understand that connected to the land, but you are on a journey to explore the world. Why do you want to spend a month just in TD in Darjeeling, you know, small village in Darjeeling, uh, when you're set out to explore the world? He says that it's healing. It's healing me. that I had uh, raised in my head as to why am I doing it because it's healing me from with super I think that's a very very positive note if we are healing mother nature if we are healing what nature has given us as opposed to contaminating it as opposed to loading it with chemicals or plastic in a way it heals us we are healing ourselves we're healing humanity we're saving lives thank you so much Utsa, for joining us of course, for all of you who would like to get in touch with TD to share that knowledge, you can uh, log on to their website. We're going to be posting a link if you want to support the work that they're doing. Again, through the link and the website, uh, I think they're also uh, raising contributions. If you'd like to contribute to their work or if you'd like to come and volunteer with them, uh, they'll be welcoming you with open arms. And definitely, if you want to have an immersive experience living in a forest dwelling, living in a mud house, having uh, experienced responsible tourism and maybe spreading the word across uh, the country, across the, uh, um, the world, uh, do log in to TD. Um, we'll be sharing all of those uh, links here with you. Thank you so much, Utsa, for TD. Thank you so much for doing the work that you're doing. And we hope to recognize you year on year with the work that you contribute year on year. Of course, Severa is open for registrations and submission of your work um, that you have completed from um, April 2020 to March 23. And I'm sure you would have done some amazing work. So we look forward to your uh, work being recognized this year as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.